this is just hard. It's a hard thing to do. I've done it a few times before, and I really didn't have any intention of going this way, but just the way the Lord has laid some things uh, at my feet in the process of time, we're, we're going to go this direction because it's important and it needs to be said. I just don't want to be the one to say it. That's, that's, that's all it is to it. I just really don't want to have to say these things. But well, I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 17. Revelation 17. We're going to look at one verse there. And then we're going to come out of it. Revelation chapter 17, verse 8. We're going to look at, and we're going to bounce out of there back to Proverbs chapter 2 where we were. Picking up around verse 12. So we're starting Revelation 17, 8. Read a verse. Then we're going to go to Proverbs. And then we'll end back up in the book of Revelation. Probably for the bulk of um, the service. I'm going to ask you a few questions this morning that I don't want you to answer. I I'm just going to ask them in general to kind of give you a format of where we are. And, and biblical understanding. The greatest need in our nation today is, and if we sat down and asked everybody, everybody would have a really good answer to what our greatest need is. Our, our greatest need in, in the United States of America, in the world today for that matter, is the, is the understanding and the adherence to sound biblical doctrine. We talked last week about, about all sins. All sins are committed out of two things. Remember what we said? There's two ways that you commit a sin. One is... Huh? Yeah, we commit them. There's two ways that we can. There's two motives behind committing sins. You don't care. You don't care. That's apathy. We know that it's a sin. Know. And you don't know. The other is ignorance. It's ignorance or apathy. Either you may not know it's a sin, and that's highly possible. Uh, without sound biblical doctrine, we really can't distinguish sin. Uh, we really don't know because we're so caught up in, uh, in, in the culture around us because we live in it every single day that it sometimes sneaks in and it will overpower and undermine biblical authority. So we need biblical authority and biblical doctrine just to understand what's right and wrong. Then, once we understand it, we need to apply it. Realize, you remember the defund the police organization? Everybody was wanting to defund the police. I went on Facebook one time and said, that's a great idea. Obviously, I don't believe that. Well, I do in a sense that I said, you know, if everybody in the world adhered to the Bible, we wouldn't need police. We wouldn't need armies. We wouldn't need guns. We, except for recreation, we, we wouldn't need any of those things. Because if everybody understood biblical doctrine and lived biblical doctrine, we wouldn't have crime. We wouldn't have stealing. We wouldn't have rape. We wouldn't have murder. We wouldn't have all those things because the Bible says you can't and you shouldn't. And if people adhered to it, they would not do those things. So there would be an entirely different world. If we understood biblical doctrine, and if we adhered to biblical doctrine, amen? Amen. So I'm going to say some things this morning, and, and, and they're going to sound difficult, but I want you to wait till we're done. And if you still think they're difficult or I was out of line, by all means, come and tell me. As with any lesson, anytime I'm, I'm up here, obviously, I want you to be like the noble Bereans, look through the scriptures, see what they say, and if I'm wrong, by all means, come tell me, because I'm not above that, amen? All right, well, let's pray, and we'll get started. Lord, you have been so very, very good uh, to us as a people who really deserve nothing. We were talking this week that we just kind of expect that, that you should give us salvation, that that's something that somehow we have earned and, and, you know, it just, that would be the right thing to do. But in all reality, salvation is an absolute gift that you were not uh, entitled to, required to. There's no reason that you had to extend salvation to a group of people who, should, who willfully uh, sinned against you. But you did. What a great expression of your love, and we're thankful for that. So help us today, Lord. I, I really would, uh, I don't know, I'd like to be somewhere else this morning. I really would. This is hard for me, and you know that. So I pray that you take your thoughts, not my thoughts, Lord, and apply them to our lives. Uh, help us to better understand what you'd have us to be and empower us, uh, because we can't do it without you, to, to do the things that you'd have us to do. Uh, Lord, we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name and all God's people said. Amen. The very first thing I want to say, is there any Cardinal fans in here? Anybody a Cardinal, yeah. Cardinal fan? Congratulations. Congratulations. You guys have been a long time coming on that. You beat a good team yesterday, 6-0 probably for the first time in a long time. That being said, it's a game. No matter what sport and what team you're a fan of, at the end of the day, it's a game. Don't don't lose priority. I don't, I'm glad for you that they won. I'm excited for you. My son-in-law is a big uh, Cardinal fan, and I'm, I'm happy for him. 
uh, at, the, at the end of the day, it's, it's just a game. If I were to ask you this morning, uh, and I have said this, that, that's why I'm going to say that. Uh, if I were to ask you this morning, are there good Mormons? And I have said from this place that there are a lot of, moral, of good moral people. Mormons are a good moral people. A lot of times they're really, you know, they're, they're socially, they, they, they do what they can, they're helpful. All that. I have said that. So if I were to ask you today, are, the, are, are, are Mormons good people? I think the majority of us would say yes. I would tell you they're not. That's exactly right. Brooke just beat me to the punchline. There's nobody good. There's no good Catholics. There's no good Jehovah Witnesses. There's no good Muslims. There's no good Baptists. The only goodness that any of us have is the imputed righteousness that, that God has given us at the point of salvation. There's nothing good about us. I mean, we may, we should, when, when we're saved, we should be, act rightly. We should do good things, and we're empowered. The Holy Spirit wants us to do good things, but if we do those things, it's contrary to our nature. It's, it's right in line with our, our new nature, but it's contrary to our old nature. So if I were to ask you today, you know, are there good Mormons? You, most of you would say, yeah, they're, you know, they're pretty good people. Are the good Jehovah Witnesses? We'd say, well, yeah, you know. Uh, that being said, and listen to me, what, I, what I'm telling you this morning is not, I'm not talking about those people. I'm talking to you about some doctrines, and I'm talking to you about some things. And basically, this is the greatest need today is for understanding biblical doctrine. In Revelation chapter 17, verse 8, we're just going to read one verse there. And then we'll come back to it. In Revelation chapter 17, we're where the seven dooms of Babylon are coming. God is about to cross the top of Babylon for the final time. And, and there is a woman who's called the great whore of Babylon. It is the religious society or system of the day. We know that's somewhere out in the future. We don't know if it's next week or 100 years from now. The Apostle Paul thought it was you know, coming in his lifetime. So we, we really don't know. It seems like, it looks like everything is kind of lining up that way with globalization. And it could be. Uh, the truth is we don't know. We should live every day as if today is the day. Amen. That's the way that we should live. Uh, in Revelation 17, verse 8, uh, verses 1 through 7 are, are going to talk about the, the destruction of Babylon and the horror of Babylon and those things. So we're going to come back to that. But I want you to understand in verse number 8 it says, The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. So everything that's, that's happening when we start back in 17 verse 1, that's happening in front of, Cameron, will you shut that thing off back there? That's happening in front of a group of people who are not saved people. Their names are not written in the book of life. If my eschatology is right, and I don't debate eschatology, I believe that at this point we're out of here. At Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1, when he says, come up hither, I believe that's when the rapture takes place. And I believe the, the church is gone at that point. So the people that are left are not part of the church. Whether they attended church every Sunday, whether they taught in a small group class, whether they, they, they preached behind, for whatever reason, everybody that's left over here is not a member of the church. Amen? Yeah. How do you become a member of the church? Somebody said it? You get saved. You get saved. You give your life to Christ. You understand that you're a sinner. And, and you say, Lord, I, I'm, I, I need mercy in your sight. And he grants that. He says, Who's, you know, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And, and anybody has the option. We also know by reading our Bible that the majority of people will not. And I don't know if it's, you know, three out of four, nine out of ten. There's different places you can pick up different numbers. But we know that great is the number that will not. And few is the number that that will. So those people are going to be here on the pla on the face of the earth at that time. And, and here's the reason. Because they either did not know sound Bible doctrine or they <coughs> ignored sound Bible doctrine. They were either ignorant of it or they were apathetic of it. Uh, and, and you can pick. And, and they'll probably fall into both groups. I don't know. A lot of times ignorance is willing. Uh, sometimes I believe if you know you want to know the truth, that's a, God will reveal it to you in a way. If you're searching for the truth, that's another subject for another time. Uh, but I want to read you some quotes. Uh, turn back. Hold your spot in Revelation. But turn back to Proverbs chapter 2. Proverbs chapter 2. 
and verse 12 through 15. We're going to read about that guy we read about last week, the, uh, the froward man. And forward, we know, means perverse or uh, against the norm, whatever. He, he, he's, he does things backwardsly from a biblical standpoint. Again, everything in the Bible is based from a biblical standpoint. You know that every time directions are given in the Bible, they're given from the point of Jerusalem. Here's another neat little trivia fact. I mean, I know everything, if you are to the left of Jerusalem on the map, you read from the left to the right. If you live to the right of Jerusalem on the map, you read from right to left. Ever thought about that? Neat little fact. I don't know what you're ever going to do with that, and if that helps you biblically at all or not. But it's just a, God bases everything from Jerusalem. Everything is geographically goes from Jerusalem, and and that's the center of the earth to Him. So it should be also be to us. At Revelation or proper, Proverbs, excuse me, uh, chapter two and verse number. 12, we learn about discretion and wisdom and understanding and knowledge. And all those things were to keep us from what? To deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh forward things. Who leave the path of uprightness. Now we talked about that, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but these people obviously, you have to be on the path of uprightness to leave it, right? So these people had some direction apparently, and, and, and they got off of it to walk in the ways of darkness. Who rejoice to do evil and delight in the frowardness of the wicked whose ways are crooked, and they forward in their paths, or they go in opposite direction of what the Lord would have you to do. Now, if I were to, uh, I don't think it would probably happen in this group this morning because you're a pretty Bible-savvy group, but if I were to probably go on Facebook or some form of social media and ask some questions about um, our different groups, Christian groups, like if I say, are, are Mormons Christians? I think the vast majority of even Baptists, I, I think, would say, yeah, sure they are. I'd say, well, Jehovah Witnesses, are they Christians? I think the vast majority of people would probably say, well, yeah. As a matter of fact, there are a lot of people who believe that we're all going to the same place, whether you worship Allah or whether you're Buddhist or whatever you are, we're all going to the same place. We're just going different routes. That's a pretty common common theology at this point. So if I were to ask you those questions, uh, you know, you probably would not because you're familiar with Bible doctrine, but a lot of people would say, uh, yeah, 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 they're, they're all Christian groups. Let me read you a couple things just from one of these groups and see, uh, see how it sounds to you biblically. This is from a book called Kingdom of the Cults. Dr. Uh, Walter Martin wrote it. It's an older book. I'm, I'm sure you can probably still get it. But here's some things that from one of these groups, I, I'll just go ahead and tell you, this is, this is some writings from the Mormons, from the Mormon church. It says, in the beginning, the head of the gods called a council of the gods, and they came together and concocted a plan to create the world and the people in it. That's, you laugh, <laughs> but there are possibly millions of people in this organization. And that is from the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith on page, I assume it's page 349. Uh, God himself was once as we are now and is, and is an exalted man. Teachings of Joseph Smith, page 345. We know in Genesis 1, 1, in, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We know there was no council. <laughs> there was no group of people that God assembled together to do that. That was just something that, that he did in his infant mind. And when it talks about God was once as we are now, uh, we know that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and, and he was there when everything was created, right? Uh, and he's always been God. We know that. But uh, they, they stray from that uh, very blatantly. Here's another one. As a man is, once was. As man is, God once was. As God is, a man may become. That's from the prophet Lorenzo Snow, uh, from the Gospel Through the Ages, and also in their writings. Here's another one. And then the Lord said, let us go down. And they went down at the beginning. And they that are, they, that is the gods, organized and formed the heavens and the earth. That's from one of their writings entitled Abraham 4.1. Uh, here's one. Uh, when our father Adam came into the Garden of Eden, he came into it with a celestial body and brought Eve, one of his wives, with him. One he helped <laughs> one of his wives. This is a quote. Uh, he helped to make and organize this world. He is Michael, the archangel, the ancient of days, about whom holy men have written and spoken. He is our father and our God and the only God with whom we have to do. That's from Brigham Young in the Journal of Discourses. 150. Did you know these things? 
This is what the Mormons believe. This is, this is their doctrine. This is what they studied from and their leaders have taught them. Um, here's a quote from a fellow whose name, he was the 10th LDS president. His name was Joseph Fielding Smith. It's an older quote. Uh, actually, this was an excerpt from a sermon that apparently lasted two hours and 15 minutes. Are you up there, Brother Paul? Yeah. Two hours and 15 minutes. The Mormons sat, did not complain while this guy went on and on with this stuff. So uh, you, you may put that away somewhere. You may need that later. <laughs> I want you all to know God, to be familiar with him, what sort of being was God in the beginning. Now, see, that starts out good. I want you all to know God and be familiar with him. That's a good thing, right? That's the secret of deception in the fair man. He always puts just enough truth in there uh, to get you to sound like this is a good idea. First, God himself, who sits enthroned in yonder heavens, is a man like unto one of yourselves. If you were to see him today, you would see him in all the person, image, and very form as a man. I'm going to tell you how God came to be God. I'm sorry, I'm trying not to laugh. Uh, we have imagined that God was God from all eternity. There are incomprehensible ideas to, that these are incomprehensible ideas to some, but they are simple and first principles of the gospel. To know for a certainty that the character of God, that we may converse with him as a man with another, and that God himself, the father of us all, dwelt on the earth, and the same as Jesus Christ himself did. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, as the Father hath power in himself, even so has the Son power. Now, I've looked for that quote. I actually thought that was in there, but there's nothing in there quite like that. Uh, and the, they use the King James Bible as well. So I don't, he's just got this a little bit off. But then he asks this question, to do what? Why did Jesus say, as the, I have power as the Father has power? Uh, why what the Father did, the answer is obvious. That's what he was here to do, do what the Father did. Here then is eternal life. To know the only wise and true God. That, that, that's pretty good. You've got to learn how to be gods yourselves. To be kings and priests unto God. Which actually is in the Bible. The same as all gods have done before you. Namely by going from a small degree to another. From grace to grace. From exaltation to exaltation. Until you are able to sit in glory. As doth those who sit enthroned in everlasting power. Now, there's just about enough truth in that that if you got up in a lot of churches this morning and read that, you may get some amens. You may get a bunch of them because there's actually a little bit of Bible in that, and there's enough sprinkle within and without, and who doesn't want to be a God? I mean, come on. Who wouldn't, who wouldn't want to do that? We watched, what was that, with the, the grandkids the other day, uh, the little island girl, uh, Moana. 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 And who's the demigod? What was his name? Maui. Y'all know, see, so don't, don't get on me for watching this. Thing. Who wouldn't want to have that kind of power and authority, right? And, and you give that to someone who knows nothing about the gospel and nothing about the truth, they would say, well, yeah, I would like to be a God one day. And how refreshing it is to know that if I just follow the path of these people, I can do that. Amen? Where does that lead eventually? It's a bad day. That's a very, very bad day. Good people do not teach this. You, do you hear me? This is not good. And I'm not saying that all Mormons are bad. Well, I'm not saying that all Mormons teach deception. But if they teach this, they're teaching deception. It may be all they know. However, it's not good. It is not a good thing. And you know, at one time, and this has been some years ago, and I haven't looked it up recently, but they said that the pews of the Mormon and the Jehovah Witness Church were packed with people who used to be Baptists. How does that happen? Every one of you are sitting in here and you're looking aghast at me when I read these quotes, thinking that's, that's absolute blasphemy. And you are right. So how do people who sit in Baptist church, or any other church for that matter, every day hear this and not know that it's blasphemy? We didn't do a good job teaching. Somebody didn't. Somebody either didn't know the truth or did not teach the truth. Let me, let me give you a couple more. This will be from the Jehovah Witnesses. Just a few. And I'm not going to do a lot of these. And literally, if you can, if, I, I will let you borrow this book if you want to. It has a lot of different groups in it. Um, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one. I just want you to know a few things. This is from uh, Kingdom of the Cults also. And this is uh, the Jehovah Witnesses' view of the deity of Jesus Christ. 
At the time of his beginning of life, he was created by everlasting God, Jehovah, without the aid or instrumentality of any mother. In other words, he was the first and direct creation of Jehovah God. He was the start of God's creative work. He was not an incarnation in flesh, but was flesh, a human son of God, a perfect man, no longer a spirit, although having a spiritual or heavenly part or background. Now they tell me that most Jehovah Witnesses can twist the average Christian into a spiritual pretzel in about 90 seconds. Because what they know, they know. They know it very well. And, and they can, you better know what you know because if you don't, they're going to get you believing what they know very quickly. If you don't understand biblical doctrine. Here's another one. Uh, this one was not Jehovah God, speaking of Jesus, but was existing in God's form. He was a spirit person. He was a mighty one, although not almighty as Jehovah God is. He was a God, but not the almighty God who is Jehovah. Speaking of Jesus, does your Bible teach you that? No. No, it does not teach you that. Uh, beginning, or being the only begotten son... The word would be a prince among the, the word would become a prince among all other creatures. In this office, he Christ bore another name in heaven, which is Michael. Other names were given to the Son in course of time. That's the teaching of the Jehovah Witnesses. Let me give you a couple just on, on hell real quick. Uh, the Bible's hell is mankind's common grave. Uh, I believe there is no punishment. There is no there. What, what do we call that? Uh, Annihilus, I believe it is we call it, when they believe that once you die, if you're not a part of Christ, you just cease to exist. That's all there is. Uh, that's not a very motivating factor not to sin, but it's a popular one. Here's another one. Hell could not be a place of torment because such an idea never came into the mind or heart of God. Additionally, to torment a person eternally because he did wrong on earth for a few years is contrary to justice. <laughs> How good it is to know the truth about the dead. It can be truly it can truly set one free from fear and superstition. Yeah, it sets you free from fear. You don't think that there's any punishment or judgment out there one day for your sin. Why do I say these things? We're reading about the the perverse man. And I don't know about you, but every time I, I, I read these verses, I think about somebody that is in a physical body that's trying to get me to go drinking or trying to get me to, you know, go do something, go to a strip club or something that my, that my flesh might want to do that I know I shouldn't do. I don't look at these things generally as spiritual illustrations, but it is. Now that perverse man can also lead you into doing things physically that you know you shouldn't do. Uh, he can also, you know, invite you to, you know, hey, we're going to go on a fishing trip. Of course, they're all going to be on Sundays or Wednesdays because that's when they always are. Uh, and it's no big deal. You know, you just miss once. not a big deal. You'll be back next week. So they will teach you to do things that, that are not good for you biblically. But they'll also teach you spiritual things that will wind you right off a cliff. Right off a cliff. This has as much a spiritual application, maybe more so. Maybe more of a spiritual application than even uh, than even we originally thought. Maybe that maybe that's the intent of it. Maybe that's what God's trying to teach. Is both work. Uh, you do what you want with it, but they're both applicable. Let's look at the other part of that, the strange woman, and, and, and see where that goes. Let's uh, verse number what seventeen sixteen to deliver thee from the strange woman, even from the stranger which flattereth with her words which forsaketh the guide of her youth and forgetteth the covenant of her God. For her house inclineth unto death and her pass unto the dead. None that go unto her return again, neither take they hold of the pass of life. Now, almost every time I have taught on that, if not every single time, I have taught it in a, kind of a physical, uh, you know, she's, she's a seductress. You know, she, she wants to get you to leave your wife. She wants you to perform car carnal acts, and all that is true. But there's another aspect to it again, as there is with most things in the Bible. There's a spiritual aspect. Back to Revelation chapter 17. The greatest need in the world today, including the church, is the understanding and the adherence to biblical doctrine. It's a big deal. And I probably haven't taught that as much as I should. And, and hear me now. There, there's not a bigger advocate for making church fun for kids than me. 
I, I didn't invent it, uh, but I sure have I sure have polished it and worked on it over. I want church to be fun for kids. I want them to want to come back. But a lot of people that are out there looking for a place for their kids to go to church, they're looking for well, what kind of activities do you have? Uh, you know what 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 do you ha you know what can you do for my kids? We we shop. We're consumers for churches. We shop churches looking for what they can offer us. The greatest thing any church can do for you is give you strong, sound Bible doctrine. If they do everything else right and miss that, it's not a church. It's not what God has intended as a church. And it's important that parents get strong physical or strong spiritual doctrine because if you don't get it, the odds of your kids getting it are greatly diminished. Now, how God's, God's a supernatural God and he can do things. He took me out of a home that had zero Bible doctrine. As far as I know, I think, I think my grandma did, but my mom had like zero. My dad never went to church, not even Christmas and Easter. And my mom would go and was my dad almost funerals and weddings. That's when my dad went to church. That was the only time. So God can take people out of places like that and put them uh, in places where they can learn strong Bible doctrine. But it's not his design. What is God's design? For your children to learn strong Bible doctrine from mom and dad. That's where they're supposed to get. And I used to tell people all the time as a youth pastor, look, if you are sending your child to our youth group to learn to be spiritual, you're not doing your job. Now, if you get it, that's a bonus, and that's what we're here for. We're here to come alongside you and to help you have your children fellowship, be in a community of other believers and learn how to be strong and learn those things. And we're here to support what you teach at home, not take the place of. If we do not have strong biblical doctrine, we cannot pass along strong biblical doctrine. And if we're not adhering to what the Bible says, we're probably not going to, if we don't know it, we can't do it, right? So it's really, really important. I, I can't stress that enough. It's really, really important that you and I understand biblical doctrine so that we can pass along. And here's the spiritual aspect of it. Revelation chapter 17, verse 1. And I'll try to get through this, just a couple of verses here fairly quickly. <clears throat> These are people who the world will call good people. They're, they're in a bad time. Man, they're in a time that the world has never seen before, and the Bible tells us. And the time of Jacob's trouble, it said the world's never seen it before. You'll never see it again. It's a devastating time. And they're all people there because they made the choice to be there. Or I'm not going to go into, you know, if they didn't hear the gospel. I, I think God makes the truth available if you want the truth. Uh, according to Romans chapter 1 and some other places. If you're searching for truth, God will get truth to you if you want truth. Uh, Revelation chapter 17, verse number 1. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Well, what in the world does that mean? Uh, she has seduced nearly everybody in the world. Nations, kings, everybody has fallen underneath this woman and she's called the great whore. She is the religious system of the last days. And what most people, everybody has so many ideas about globalism and all the benefits it can have and, and all the things that it can do. And of course, it's amazing that a guy from you know 2,000 years ago wrote all this stuff down that we would get under a, a one currency, which we all said could never happen. I think they could digitalize it tomorrow, or digitize it tomorrow if they wanted to. The, the econ I think I think it's pretty close. I think that's what they're actually going for. We had no concept growing up that anything like this was even remotely possible, and we're just close to this stuff going on. And you know, God says, uh, "Hey," He says. Uh, this woman is going to sit upon many waters. And if you look down at verse number 16, that can be kind of confusing. Or verse number 15, it says this. And he saith unto me, the waters which thou sawest where the whole world, where the horse sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So this woman is a religious system that's sitting on top and in charge of everybody in the world. And once a one, we get a one world government, it's going to be the religion they pick. you got no choice. There, there's not going to be freedom. It's going to be conformity. That's conformity or death. And, and, and you know that, I think, so I don't have to spend a lot of time there. Verse number two, uh, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Fornication, we talked about, I think, last week, is sex before marriage. That means that these leaders and these kings and these nations and the people that are running the planet are not part of the bride of Christ. 
because the church left in Revelation 4.1. So this is not adultery. They were not followers of God at one point and then left. I, I would say by the meaning of this, they're people that never had a relationship with Christ, never desired a relationship with Christ. They didn't leave it. Uh, they, they just rejected it. They flat turned away from it. And so they were never married. This is, this is seduction uh, and, and that kind of thing outside of marriage. And then it talks about in the bottom of that verse about being dra made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Their judgment is impaired with her doctrine. Their judgment is impaired with her doctrine. Now, if you drink enough alcohol, your judgment will be impaired. How many of you say amen right there? Yeah, I've made some really bad decisions on alcohol. Matter of fact, I don't know that I've ever made a good decision on alcohol. Uh, probably to go home and quit drinking was the best decision I ever made. But they're going to make bad decisions because of the influence that they're under. And we are all making decisions under the influence that we willingly submit to. When we do things that we should not do, it's because we were under the influence of our flesh or somebody else or whatever, and we willingly submit to do things that we should not. That's what these people are doing. The only difference is it's like the whole planet at this point. And because of their lack of discernment, they're happy to stay in it. See, Brother Tim, that's kind, of, that's kind of outlandish. Can I just bring up to you a little brief history of Germany in World War II? Not that long ago. Not that long ago. And we should all remember it. And we should probably teach it in our classes and our schools every day. I don't even know if they teach World War II or not. But there was a guy that took over. And, and he was never excommunicated from the Catholic Church. Adolf Hitler was a member of the Catholic Church. Never excommunicated. And if you read some of his writings, we don't have time this morning. But he was heavy into the, the Jesuit priests, uh, the Catholic Church. He was a big believer. And, and they started just singling people out. You know, this group, the, the homosexuals, the uh, the, the, the Down syndrome people, the people who had physical conditions which weren't part of the superior race. And eventually they got to the Jews because that's what the devil always wants to do anyway is kill the Jews. And the Bible tells me there's some horrible things going on in Israel right now. But, but people who, who you would think were good people. And I, we probably all heard the story about the one woman that talked about from World War II. She said, you know, we, we had a church right beside the tracks and, and they would bring train loads, car loads of people, Jews by going to the concentration camps. And they would scream and holler for help. And we would hear the trains coming, and it got to be that we started singing songs when we heard a train coming because to drown out their screams. And we would sing hymns louder and louder and louder just to drown out the cries because we did not want to hear them. Did you get that? People who are sitting in church are singing hymns so loud that they can't hear people being hauled off to their death. How do, how does, how do we ever get to that point? They were under an influence and a seduction and a force so strong that once they got under it, they couldn't get out from underneath it and didn't attempt to. Now, there were people in Germany who did, uh, uh, what's uh, Corrie ten Boom, uh, some of those people who, who made it their lives trying to get the Jews out of there and help you. So there were a few. There was a remnant who helped. But by, you see, here's what I'm trying to tell you. There were people just like me and you in Germany that just slowly, gradually, kept giving in and giving in and giving in until they got to the point where they wouldn't stand up. And you think, I could never get there. <laughs> I hope that's true. I hope that I could never get there. But I'm watching the way things are rolling out. And I'm thinking, people that I never thought are getting there. They're, they're getting to that point. And that's the way it's going to be in the end. And let me tell you, uh, Christians would be a big target. We know there are going to be people martyred for their faith in the truth. We know that. Uh, again, I believe the church goes out in Revelation 4, 1. That's, that's my eschatological view. Uh, you can disagree with that if you want. But because of people's lack of discernment, they were happy to stay in the place that they were. And, and they ended up not leaving it. Verse number 3. And so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a, a scarlet-covered beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven hands and ten horns. She's wealthy. Uh, and she does not hide her blasphemy anymore. There was a lot of times, that, like in, in the churches that we looked at and the, the groups that we just looked at, they sprinkle just enough truth in there to make it palatable and get people in the door, and then later on they're in so far that they don't get back out. This is not that case anymore. We are, we are, we are open blasphemy. We've got it on our crown. We want everybody to know. How many of you are seeing things today in our society that you thought you would never, ever see be done on a public level? They're not hiding anymore. No. 
it's like, it's like here it is. We're not even going to try to disguise it anymore. Here it is. It's, it's just in your face. What are you going to do about it? It's kind of what's going on here. Uh, verse number four. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet colors and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Uh, she has wealth. She has power and authority. In her cup is the blood of saints. Revelation 16, 6. You can also see it over in Revelation. I think it's in, I think, the chapter that we're in. Uh, the, the blood of the saints and the martyrs are in the cup of her fornications and her idolatries. I want you to write some things down for me. And we're not going to talk. I just want you to go there and look. I'm not going not to frame them for you. I'm just going to give you some things to Google. I want you to Google August 24th, 1572. If you're interested about the blood of saints. August 24th, 1572. October 23rd, 1641. Be careful because that will try to give you 1642. You may have to scroll down that a little bit and what actually happened in 1641. But it was October 23rd, 1641. I want you to I really want you to look that up because I don't think you're aware of what happened. I want you to look up the Astashi of World War II. U-S-T-A-S-H-I. U-S-T-A-S-H-I. The Astashi of World War II. Do a little research on that. I've spent weeks on it, but I want you to look it up. And it would be a, a great benefit of you as well to understand this. How many of you have a copy of Fox's book of Christian Martyrs? Anybody have that at home? Um, if you want to borrow it, I have a copy. Um, I will give you a copy. We'll buy you a copy or whatever. Every Christian should read. That should be required. Brother Paul, do you agree with that? Fox's book of Christian Martyrs should be a required reading for every Christian. should be. You really need to hear that. I mean, you should. It, it's, uh, you need to write those things down. Uh, and, and, and maybe we'll talk about them next week, maybe not. Catch me off to the side and we'll, maybe we'll talk about some other way. So verse number five. And upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery Babylon, the great harlot, the mother of harlots, and the abominations of the earth. Um, if you know what happened in Babylon, we just heard a great message on it uh, while we were down there. The, the world, God told them, go out, spread out, multiply, replenish the earth. He told Noah after the flood, uh, there was a group of people who decided, here's what we're going to do. We're going to get together. We're going to unite ourselves against God in rebellion to God to be gods. They gathered together in the plains of Shinar. And they said, we're going to build towers high as heaven. And we're going we're to make our own gods. We're, we're going to be self-sufficient. We really don't need God. Uh, that's the same thing as what's going on here. Uh, that's what Babel was, and that's what Babel will be again. All these people are going to get together, rebel against God, and, and shake their fist at the God of heavens, thinking that they're actually going to pull this thing off in full belief, under the deception, because they have no biblical doctrine or have rejected it, and, and, and God is going to come back and set all things right. Uh, verse number 6, I think, is where we're at, right? And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of saints. There it is and with the blood of martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Uh, yeah, and that's not that he admired her. That's not what that means. He meant he looked at that, and, he, and he, here's what he said to himself. How could anyone get this far? John, the writer of the book of Revelation, is, is looking at her and what she's accomplished and her holding a cup full of blasphemies full of blood of Christian people who never did anything but tried to share the gospel with other people. And, and he's, he's wondering, how did it ever get here? How could this possibly have happened? And I think we all ask the same question. I think we should. I, you know, I wonder in my heart, how could we ever get here? But we can look at the past. We can look at history. We can look at what happened to the, the early church in, the, in Rome when Nero hated the Christians and, and set the city on fire, blamed it on the Christians. And people believed it. And they threw them in the, in the Colosseums. And they fed them to the lions. And they did horrible, horrible things to them. But because a person in power had some authority and people were afraid for whatever reason, they submitted to it. You see why I did not want to do this this morning? This, this is not a lot of fun for me. Uh, Proverbs 2.18. How did it get this far? 
Proverbs 2.18 tells us that her house inclineth unto death. Her house inclineth unto death. Do you know what that means? What's an incline? It's a slant. <clears throat> we were just in the mountains of North Carolina. Do you know sometimes what they lack? Inclines. They have cliffs. Straight up. This is not, Kentucky is more of an inclined state. It's a gradual slope. Some may be a little steeper than others. Her house inclineth unto death. The, the great whore. She doesn't start out holding out a cup of blasphemies full of, hey, we're going to kill a bunch of people. We're, we're going we're to do that. It's gradual. Just like every one of us who have ever gone into <clears throat> sin have done. It's gradual. Ooh, nothing happened. Still okay. Still got my family. Still got my job. Still got my, it's not that bad. And we just keep easing away. And it's always a downward slope. Your, your direction from church and from God is always down. It's never up. No matter whether you prosper financially, no matter whether you prosper materially, uh, socially, whatever. If your path is away from God, it's an incline. And you know what the incline is? It's unto death. That's what the Bible tells her house is an incline, a gradual incline into a dark, dark place. Why, why, why am I saying all that this morning? I, I'm just, I, I, I was probably coming this direction anyway, but I was so, so, God so impressed on me, the, the need for, for doctrine and for us to wake up a little bit because um, we can get comfortable here and think, I'm, I'm okay. You know, I, I'm coming to church. A couple times a week or two or three times, and I'm doing good, and maybe you are, and that's great. I hope that you are. I hope that your path is steadily inclining up. But we must be very, very careful, not for ourselves, but for our brethren and our brothers and our sisters in Christ as well. And when we see them easing away, we need to wrap our hands and arms around their ankles and plead with them and love them and do everything we can, as well as the lost who are inclining this direction, we know where they're going to end up. This is not maybe. This is absolute assuredly. This is, this is where this is going. And the only hope those people have is us. That's it. Amen? If we aren't, if we aren't standing in the gap, it's a steady <laughs> incline until they can no longer ascend back up again. It's down, down, down. And we know where it ends. Cheerful stuff, huh? There are no good people. You're not good. I'm not good. Well, Paul's probably better than us, but he's not good either. Uh, just the righteousness that God has given us is all the only goodness that we have. And it's the only thing that we can exercise. We cannot be kind enough to anybody to get them into eternity. We need strong biblical doctrine. We need to follow what the book says, live what the book says, and steadily, I mean steadily, review ourselves and our lives and see. Are we slipping? Because it's always gradual. And we slip and we slip and we slip. And you know what? We'll do some things that aren't biblical. And after a while, we'll get comfortable with them, right, Brooke? And, and, and eventually, we may influence somebody else to get comfortable with it, too. And that's not where we need to be. Strong Bible doctrine. Hear the book. Read the book. Know the book. Learn the book. Love the book. Amen? All right. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this time. Uh, I really still am... Uh, just in utter amazement that all the things that I have done in my lifetime that you would uh, still extend mercy and grace to me.